Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Mark chapters 11 and 12. In chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, we see Christ entering Jerusalem. Now, this is the second time that all four Gospels record the same event. We see it in Matthew 21, 1 through 11, Luke 19, 29 through 44, John 12, 12 through 19. The first time that all four Gospels record the same event was the feeding of the 5,000 men. Now note how Jesus refers to himself as the Lord in verse 3 when giving his disciples the instruction to find the colt of a donkey to him so that he can fulfill Zechariah 9.9 and affirm that he was the long-expected Messiah, the King, the Son of David. Note also that the crowd was spreading their coats and leafy branches on the road. That was an ancient practice when welcoming a new king to a city. 2 Kings 9.13 shows something similar. John, by the way, in his gospel specifies that these were palm branches, John 12, 13. That's why the church calls the Sunday before Easter Palm Sunday. And when the crowd saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they were actually quoting from Psalm 118, 26, which was part of the Hallel or, or the praise that was especially featured at Passover. Chapter 11, verses 12 through 26, Christ displays his authority. After entering Jerusalem to much fanfare, Jesus returns to Bethany until the next day. And on the way back to Jerusalem, he curses a fruitless fig tree, providing a visual illustration of the value that God places on his people being fruitful for him, useful in serving the Lord. Israel, like the fruitless fig tree, had pretended to be faithful, but had failed to bear spiritual fruit for God. Jesus then authoritatively cleans house in the temple. Now, the temple here is referring to the entire area on Mount Zion within which the temple itself actually sat. So that would be, uh, you would have a court of Gentiles, which any Gentiles or Jews, they could come into. Then the court of the women, the court of the Israelites, and the court of the priests. With each court, you're getting closer to the temple, and less people could actually pass through the gate to the next court. Only the approved persons could enter those various courts as they approach the temple proper. So the market that Jesus cleans out was actually located in the outermost court, the court of the Gentiles. And as Christ rightly puts it, the house that was supposed to represent the Lord's presence within Israel and the worship of God by his people had been turned into a wretched hive of greedy people who sought to make a quick buck off their fellow Jews who were procuring sacrificial animals for Passover. And really, it's quite the scene that's made by Christ here. Jesus is flipping tables. He's forcibly driving out all those taking part in these dishonorable transactions. And he's not allowing the buyers, sellers, or money changers from leaving with their goods. And yet, note how it was not Christ's uh, before that, that Mark hones in on. It's not Christ's clean, cleaning out and all the actions that are occurring. It's the teaching by Jesus that Mark points out had the whole crowd astonished. Look at verse 18. And this is the final straw for the chief priests and scribes. Jesus had messed with the lucrative side business of which they as the leaders who had allowed it would surely be getting a cut of the profit. In their minds, Jesus had to be destroyed. And after leaving the temple, we see that Jesus' curse of the fig tree from verse 14, of course, came true. And it was a perfect teaching moment for Christ to exhort his disciples to truly believe that God has all power, authority, and goodness to fulfill his will. Therefore, if we pray according to his will and forgive others according to his will, the Lord will grant our requests and extend to us such forgiveness of our own sins. In chapter 11, verses 27 through 33, Christ's authority is questioned. As Jesus walked through the city of Jerusalem once again, the chief priests and scribes and elders challenged his authority, questioning why Jesus was able to perform miracles and teach and preach the way he did. But they refused to answer his return question about John the Baptist's ministry out of a fear of man and a refusal to give up their religious power and prestige and possessions. So Jesus rightly refused to affirm that his authority did indeed come from heaven, just as John's baptism ministry was also from heaven. In chapter 12, verses 1 through 12, we see Christ the stone. Jesus takes the opportunity to teach, as he so often did, but here he speaks in parables. And that means the religious leaders would not fully understand the lesson that he's conveying. They did catch, however, that the parable of the vine growers was against them. In fact, if they recalled Isaiah 5 correctly, they would see that Jesus was calling the religious leaders of Israel the vine growers who had rebelled against God, the owner of the vineyard, which was Israel. After all, the religious leaders and their ilk who preceded them were the ones who had opposed the genuine prophets who came on behalf of the Lord. 
They're called slaves in this parable. And the religious leaders were certainly intending to kill the son of the vineyard's owner, as we've already seen in chapter 11, verse 18, and as we see in chapter 12, verse 12. When Christ completes this lesson by then referring to himself as the stone, the stone which the builders, the leadership in Israel, would reject and stumble over. And that's from Psalm 118, 22, which is the same psalm that the crowd sang as they welcomed Jesus into the city in chapter 11, verse 9. We also see Isaiah 8, 14, and 1 Peter 2, 8, confirming that this is the stone that would be rejected and stumbled over. But Christ is also the stone which would become the chief cornerstone of the church, the bedrock that all those who truly trust in him live their lives on top, right, that we stand on. And again, Psalm 118, 22, Ephesians 2, 20, 1 Peter 2, 6 and 7, we see Christ, the cornerstone of the church. Then chapter 12, verses 13 through 37, Christ answers his opponents. How patient of Jesus to willingly hear the Pharisees and Herodians and Sadducees each of whom are seeking to cause him to stumble and ensnare himself with an answer to their questions that would either give them legitimate cause to arrest Christ or would cause the crowds to turn on him. And, of course, the unmatchable wisdom of God is on display in Jesus. As he expertly handles both lines of questioning with ease, he affirms that taxes belong to the government one lives in. He affirms the resurrection of the dead as well. And then a wonderful event occurs. A scribe sees that Jesus has expertly answered his opponents and asks Jesus to answer which of all the commandments in the Mosaic law was the first, the foremost, the one that should take the most priority. And Jesus refers back to the Shema, hear, O Israel, from Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, to make clear there is just one God, and the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord with every iota of our Hearts, souls, minds, and strength. And then Jesus refers to Leviticus 19.18 to explain the second greatest commandment is to love our neighbors as ourselves. And note here in verse 34, Christ's encouraging commendation of the scribe when the man agrees with Jesus' answer. And then Christ ends this face-off with the religious leaders by challenging their erroneous view on the nature and work of God. He actually uses Psalm 110.1 to make clear that the promised Messiah would be the son of David, but also would be David's Lord. That would necessitate God taking on human flesh to fulfill that prophecy, which would greatly challenge their view on who the Lord is and the work that he brings about. And then the rest of chapter 12, verses 38 through 44, Christ on giving. Uh, Jesus warns his disciples in the crowds about the narcissistic tendencies of the religious leadership. They're seeking the attention and praises of mankind. They're only about themselves. They're not about others. And he also is warning them of the terrible burden that those leaders placed on poor Jews who earnestly wanted to obey the Lord. So the example Christ gives is often misunderstood as a, as a commendation of this widow for giving her very last two bits of money, her last two mites, small copper coins. Actually, what Jesus is doing is reprimanding the religious leadership for not accurately teaching that giving that Israel was supposed to be engaged in. If they had taught accurately, the widow would not have been putting her very last mites into the temple treasury. She would have been giving the correct percentage as revealed in the Mosaic Covenant, around 23% over a whole year. And, and let me restate it. She would not be doing it as, a, as an obligation giving her last bit of money. Certainly, if that was a desire from her heart to stretch herself to that point and give everything she had and trust the Lord for his provision, that was as well within the bounds of worshiping the Lord. That is uh, actually the free will giving that we see in the New Covenant, we see in the New Testament. The problem was is that she is being burdened by the religious leaders. We see that in verse 40 when Jesus describes that the, the scribes were devouring widows' houses. They were burdening these poor widows. They were burdening these poor folk to give everything they had when the rich people were not giving everything they had. So yes, the widow was being more faithful than the rich people, but that's a knock on the rich who should have been giving more than they were but were too tied to their money to be parted from it. As we just read these two chapters, may our faithfulness to the Lord be from the inside, from our heart, souls, mind, and strength, and not just a mere show on the outside. May we worship King Jesus, submit to his authority, and look forward to the resurrection of those who repent from sin and trust in him. This has been Mark chapters 11 and 12, and I hope you have a great day.